Good morning, everybody. Just so you're aware, and I'm, I'm warning you, I, this is my fancy new toy. This is a 360-degree camera. So there's nowhere in this room you can run away from it. <laughs> there's nowhere in this room I can run away from it. Uh, and hopefully I'll get a good copy, and maybe we'll be able to put this up on YouTube, and then you can put on your Google Cardboard and take a look around the room while you're doing the talk. Anyway, OK. I have been looking forward to this talk for, I think Martin has been trying to schedule this with, for like 18 months. And so thank goodness I'm here today. Thank goodness I'm, I'm here with all of you. I'm going to start off with, I've been doing research for this talk for months now, and things just sort of float by every once in a while. And this one floated by, and it was as if it had come down from heaven. I'm going to be coming back to this repeatedly. Now, the funny thing is, this is the Herald, right? Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is the, the Australian, March 26th, you know, with the headmaster of Sydney Grammar. And the, the tagline, computers in class are scandalous toys. <laughs> now, just, just keep that in mind. We will be coming back to this. But just keep that in mind. That, that, that's an interesting starting point for some of the things that we're going Okay. This also came across my Twitter feed. I follow what 11,000 people on Twitter, and when it's not actually making me crazy, there are little jewels like this that come across. Kids are so inquisitive. Will robots ever take over the world? Uh, almost certainly. But when? Before I die? Yeah. A bit before, yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a very good friend down in Melbourne, Matt. And I was going down to Melbourne to do some work at the end of January. And Maddie said, I'll come pick you up at the airport. It's like, I'm arriving at 7 o'clock in the morning. No, no, no worries. I will come and pick you up. I know why he volunteered. Because she bought the second Tesla in on sale in Australia. And all he has done for the last year since he got that Tesla was rave about how amazing the Tesla is. So that morning, get to the airport, there he is. His six-year-old is in the back seat playing on an iPad because he's about to go into year one. And although all the other kids have gone to school, I think it's a day or two before he gets to go to school. So he was coming into work with dad that morning. I jump into the Tesla, and we leave Telemarine, and we go down the highway, and we're then on the city link, and we're in rush hour traffic. And we're in rush hour traffic at around 100 kilometers an hour. And Matt, and we're having a very animated conversation, because we're both startup people, and we're talking about the things that are being funded, and da 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 And then Matt just sort of breaks and says, you do realize I am not driving. <laughs> and I hadn't actually, until that moment, realized and I took a photo, that is the photo, in the high-speed lane of the city link, in peak hour. And that man is not touching the wheel, which is, I think, technically vaguely illegal. But <laughs> and I can get to, get to touch it every so often or something, right? The car is driving itself. Now, the funny thing about that was that it was really exciting for four minutes. <coughs> and then we got bored and immediately went along. I took a photo. I was like, OK, I've got to take a photo of this. Because it turns out that being driven around is about the least interesting thing in the world. Because from the time you came home from the hospital, you have been driven around. <laughs> the thing that's slightly different about it is that it's the car that's doing the driving. But the six-year-old in the back seat was playing with his iPad because all he's ever going to know is that cars drive themselves. Rule one to understand the world we live in is technology is anything that was invented after you were 20. And so now we're going to talk about the world for the kids who aren't 20 yet, the kids whom you are educating. And what will be baseline for them is going to be very odd for us. OK. In March, I don't know if you saw it. It was reported in the news, although mostly in the tech news. This is a game of Go. This is a Chinese game of strategy. It is considered by 
find all who study it to be the hardest of all possible games to play. Why? Because essentially, on every turn, you have an unlimited number of opportunities. It's not like chess where there's a whole bunch of rules or poker where there's a whole bunch of rules. Every turn, anything can happen. <coughs> Human beings get to be very, very good Go players. Computers have never been very, very good Go players because it's too hard. Because even the very best human Go players, they develop a very rich intuition. And they use that intuition. And they can't explain that intuition to anyone as a guy being able to play Go. So some engineers at Google UK developed a program that they called AlphaGo. And they got uh, Ando, that kid right there, who is considered to be maybe the greatest, he's certainly a grandmaster at Go. And they said, well, give it a go, we'll see how he plays against it. AlphaGo won four out of five matches, just blew the human being away. My feeling is that AlphaGo threw the fifth match so that we wouldn't get scared. <laughs> <laughs> Even the engineers and scientists at Google were surprised at how well they figured they might win one match. Now we're going to come back to why it did as well as it did in a minute. But all of a sudden, things got a lot more interesting because all of a sudden, it became clear that we could teach a computer to grow an intuitive sense. It's the only way you're going to. Now, this isn't the first time that a computer has been beating the pants off of a human being playing some sort of fun game. Back in 2011, a little company called IBM wanted to show off a new system for artificial intelligence that they called Watson, and they wanted to show how amazing <coughs> it was. So what they decided they were going to do is they were going to stage a competition of the game show Jeopardy. Remember Jeopardy, where you get the answer and you have to figure out what the question is? And all your answers have to rephrase this question so you're disqualified. And of course, that's fun because it requires very nonlinear thinking. You have to connect all sorts of dots that aren't necessarily directly related. And so IBM got the two best human players of Jeopardy and ganged them up against Watson, and what happened was that Watson wiped the board with them. <laughs> I mean, the humans didn't do badly, but Watson just sort of cleaned up. Now, that was in 2011, and it's a great way to sort of tell the world, hey, you've got a cool computer program that maybe can think kind of like a human. But you don't build a computer program to win a TV show. Right? That would be an enormous waste of time and money. What you do build this kind of computer for is so that once it's won this competition, you can send it to medical school. And IBM has deep links into several different facilities in America, including the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, which is basically considered to be the best place in the world to get treatment if you have cancer. And so for three years, Watson worked with the oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and at the end of three years, they had something called Watson for Oncology. Now, the interesting thing about Watson for Oncology is because Watson is a computer program, it could absorb 60,000 patient histories and understand the treatment strategies and what had worked and what had not worked, which is more than any human oncologist could ever do. Watson can take a patient who has appeared at a clinic and may be resisting a treatment and take that symptom of cancer and compare it against every possible available clinical trial and find exactly the right clinical trial for that patient. Again, something that no oncologist can do because no oncologist can get their mind around that much information. Now, IBM started rolling this out 
formerly a hospital black hair. And when they came to Australia, I met with one of the fellows who was doing this. They were selling it into Royal North Shore. I don't know if they've done that. I think they have. And I said, isn't this going to be freaking me out? What was this out? Are you putting them out of this? Ah, he was quiet. What a quiet voice in the oncologist ear. We're the ones who are advising the oncologist how to make the best possible decision all of the time. So they look at it as a partnership. And I actually think this is an amazing thing because what happens if you're not in Sydney? What if you're in Dubbo? What if you're in Alice and you get cancer and you need treatment and all you have is your local GP? Well, if your local GP has lots of oncology, then you're going to get in the same class of treatment as someone who's in Sydney or someone who's in New York. And you know that within a decade, this is going to be connected to an app on your smartphone so that whether you're a patient or you're a doctor, you're going to have access to this kind of intelligence all of the time. And oncology is just one thing that Watson is being used for. A company in Canada fed Watson, because Watson can read and can, to some sense, understand what it reads, fed the entire Canadian legal corpus, all of the decisions, all of the laws, all of the judgments, all of the precedents, and they created something called Howard by Ross. <laughs> this is what happens when you make a solicitor out of an artificial intelligence. All right, so it's somewhere between a paralegal and a solicitor in its capabilities. It hasn't it doesn't have a formal law degree, but if you rock up to it and say, okay, I'm doing a case that involves X, Y, and Z, can you give me all of the relevant cases to cite in this? And there you go. We've been hearing an awful lot about how robots are gonna put people out of work. And we've been riding around thinking that's going to be people in low-skilled occupations. Ladies and gentlemen, if it isn't clear, let me emphasize the point. The opposite is true. The robots will be eating the high-level cognitive occupations first. <laughs> and we need to educate kids for a world where that is going to be the baseline. Because guess what? It ain't ever going to slow down. It ain't ever going to stop until it's done. So our job as educators is to teach kids to thrive in a world where everything is so smart that the only way they can stay ahead is by learning how to leverage that intelligence, which is embedded in every element of the world, to their advantage. How do we do that? Well, I think we do that by teaching them how to share what they know. There's a lot to sharing. But the basic idea here is an idea that we've been familiar with in a formal sense for just a little bit over 50 years because of this guy. Do any of you know who this is? Martin, you probably do, so you're not allowed to say. Do any of you know who this is? This is a gentleman by the name of Douglas Engelbart. You may not know who he is, but you're somewhat familiar with what he did. You see that device that he's holding in his hand? He's actually holding two things in his hand. He's holding this thing that looks like sort of a rough box and then something else over here, all right? That thing there, that's the very first computer mouse in the world, because he invented it. Now, why did he invent the computer mouse? In the late 1950s, early 1960s, Engelbart became consumed with an awareness that the world was becoming more and more complex, and human beings 
we're kind of not getting smarter fast enough to deal with the complexity that the world was offering. And so he decided as a personal mission, fortunately he was backed up by a big, powerful organization, that he was going to make tools that would augment human intelligence. They would be the scaffolding that people would be able to use to be smarter, to make the best of a more complicated world. So he spent all of the 60s doing this. In December of 1968, he unveiled all of this. Now you know, Steve Jobs used to be famous for giving these amazing product demos. People still try to emulate this and blow people away. Everyone who has ever done one of those <coughs> is basically copying what he did in December of 1968. If you go into Google or YouTube and type in the words, the mother of all demos, you'll find it because it's all on video. In this one demo, Engelbart revealed a couple of things. He invented hypertext. So the idea that you can link documents together, what the World Wide Web does, that's him. Because he realized as a baseline to be able to make ourselves smarter, we're going to have to, we have to show the links between things. And in order to be able to navigate hypertext, you had to have something you could hold in your hand so you could click on links, bam, you get a mouse. And because you want to be able to collaborate with people when you're sharing links, he also invented video conferencing. This is in one 20-minute talk. All right? I used to joke that he did it all, and the rest of the 20th century computing was just sort of working on the details. But it's pretty much true. All of this was geared around this one idea of building a scaffolding for people so that people could share knowledge and be smarter and be more effective in a more complicated world. I had the enormous pleasure of meeting Douglas when he was about 80. Now, he passed away in, I think, 2012. But this was in 2002. He was a little bitter. He was crusty in the way that you'd expect an old man who saw the future to be crusty for the future that hadn't quite worked out with all of the pieces that he thought was needed. Because we'd had the web for a few years by then. The web wasn't bad. But in 2002, the web we had, it's very hard to remember. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we, we haven't. We didn't have a strong infrastructure for knowledge sharing on the web in 2002. And he was very frustrated and he was being very clear about this. And I was invited to give a talk at this commemoration at OSU, which is his alma mater. Um, I was invited to give a talk and I talked about the culture of knowledge sharing and how that could possibly work and how I had very high hopes still unfulfilled for this. As I got off stage, someone else who was also presenting at the conference, remember this is in February of 2002, said, Mark, have you ever heard of something called Wikipedia? <laughs> Now, Wikipedia was only a year old at this point. It only had about 14,000 articles, most of which <coughs> were similar to ar articles in a child encyclopedia. And 14,000 articles was around the same size as a child encyclopedia. I hadn't heard of Wikipedia. I checked it out. I was like, this is great. It's a toy, but it's great. Here's something you need to remember. Almost everything that's revolutionary starts off looking like an expensive toy. Always goes through a phase. Remember when we thought smartphones were expensive toys? That wasn't very long ago. Uh, so what happened with Wikipedia? Well, it was a toy, but enough people were interested enough by the toy to go and check the toy out. And because Wikipedia was an open system for being able to share, some people would find something that they wanted to add to it or something they wanted to correct in it, and they would improve the quality of the toy. And as the quality of the toy got better, it got more interesting to more people who would come by and check out the toy and maybe edit it or add an article, and all of a sudden this virtuous cycle developed. And over a course of a couple of years ago, from 14,000 articles to where we are now, which is somewhere over 5 million in English. As far as I know, I was the first person to ever mention Wikipedia in a room full of educators in Australia. This would have been in probably October of 2004, down in Melbourne. And the educators didn't know quite what to make of it. I just sort of mentioned it through that there. And within two years, they were up in arms about it. They were screaming, oh my god, this is going to be horrible. This is not good. It's not accurate. 
And of course, somewhere after that, a nature article came up that took a look at the accuracy of Wikipedia articles versus the Britannica articles and found that they were both, on average, equally accurate. And that did for Britannica. Mm -hmm. 250 years, poof. But it also meant that within minutes, it was OK to use as a resource. But it was also showing us something. It's not just that Wikipedia is something <coughs> we all use it, though I'll come back to that. It shows us that there is now a new mechanism for knowledge formation, something that is, in fact, entirely new, that is only possible because we're all connected around a common web of sharing knowledge and information. Engelbart probably died reasonably happy because of this. There have been consequences to Wikipedia, though. The world is qualitatively different because of Wikipedia. And I'm going to give you one very simple example that will show you how much the world has changed. So I moved to Australia in 2003. And within two weeks of arriving, I had already been invited out to play pub trivia. <laughs> Pub trivia was a lot of fun. You got out of the pub with your friends. You'd have a couple of drinks. I think we nearly won the meat tray that night. <laughs> That's 2003. If you play pub trivia in 2016, you essentially have to strip yourself naked and go hide in a bunker on the ground. <laughs> because all of us have so much access to high quality information instantaneously now that essentially pub trivia requires that you step into a time machine, go back to a time before we had it, and play it there. And that is telling us something very, very important about how big the change that we are just living through right now is and how that's going to impact how we work as people who are charged with passing on the knowledge culture to another generation. 